But, but it had the experience of walking with Abby and having a stranger come over and say, hey, you look just like Abby Oppenheim. No. Um, uh, and what would you say Johanna's influence was on him? And, uh, well, I, I'll be, I want to be honest. I didn't know Johanna very much. Uh, I was friends with Anita, and um, I met her. I met her. Abby introduced me to her, and I saw her again uh, when Abby wasn't a fugitive anymore a couple of times. I saw her at a memorial service for Abby in L.A., but I didn't know Johanna very well. My sense was she was a good influence on him. She, certainly when he was underground, uh, she provided some companionship for him, for sure, and some stabilizing center. I had that house um, up on the Russian River, uh, the, Russian, the, the uh, Thousand Islands, yeah, the Canadian border there in New York. And that was great for him. When he so became, I think she had a great influence on him. When he became Barry Free, do you remember that? And uh, when he became politically active in to save the river, did you think? Did you talk to him and say, "Are you nuts?" I mean, mm -hmm. no. There was a period when a, when Abby was up there on the river. I I did go up to that place after he wasn't the fugitive anymore a couple of times, but not during the Save the River period. Um, uh, I think he was get somewhat withdrawn. And, and, and uh, I mean, I, I knew something about it. I mean, I get, he'd send me messages. But I didn't, you know, but I think my attitude, what I, that what I knew of Save the River, he seemed to be happier and saner than he had been when he came to Woodstock. And I was willing to say, well, you know, I guess this is what he has to do. At least he's not telling people he's Abby Hoffman, you know. When you when you heard the thing about Moynihan and he's testifying before Tom, are you thinking? Well, I thought that's just another great Abby stunt. You know, that's, that's in a long list of, of, of uh, great stunts and pranks and uh, theatr theatrical gestures, you know. What, what kind of man was he when he came back and, and tried to re-energize, so to speak, the movement and um, meet with young people? And he was more serious. I think he was probably by then more thoughtful, intellectual, more of an intellectual. Um, uh, he had this idea of maybe setting up a, 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 a school for organizers, training organizers, because that's what he always, you know, like you say, well, Abby was a hustler. Well, Abby always thought of himself first and foremost as an organizer. And I'm sure as an organizer, he would teach people how to hustle. See? Uh, and um, so he had a, and he, he got involved in, uh, um, I remember Amy Carter was involved with her, yeah, right. and he, he he was actually arrested and on trial again for some sort of demonstration thing. Um, he, his, his Save the River work definitely. Well, he did an amazing thing if you think about it. When when I when the New York Daily News had all these headlines of. Abby being busted as a major coke dealer. Now, he wasn't a major coke dealer, but he wasn't a, a, a petty little friend next to a neighbor coke dealer either. Uh, when, he, when, when, when that stuff broke, I thought that he was politically through. I thought that he had destroyed his reputation and they couldn't recover. Abby really knew how to work it. I mean, once, you know, he, he, even though he was a fugitive from a coke charge and not a political charge, he was able to get people to think of himself as a political fugitive. And, of course, his Save the River work really helped to do that because he was, in fact, continuing to be a political activist even when he was underground.
So he emerged with a very good reputation. He had survived the, the, the coke bust and, and had now a reputation as an environmentalist. And um, uh, so I would say I was hopeful about him. Um, did, did you, but toward the end, um, did, did, did you, he was saying that, you know, some of these young protesters didn't even know a decent protest song. They thought that Abby Hoffman was a woman. They, that it, 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 he sort of in, retreats to this turkey coop in Pennsylvania. He, he just feels like it. Just feels like he's just really kind of a sad figure. At that well, point. I think Abby, my hunch is from what I know in conversations I had with him at the toward the end, and also some letters that I saw that he wrote to Anita, which she showed me. She was good enough to show me. Um, he really got into this thing of um, that it, it, it was like he, he did have, he, like what he said in Miami, he did want to do new stuff, did want to do new stuff. And he had kind of gotten forced back into the old stuff. And, and it got less and less interesting. More and more the young people he was meeting came to be entertained by him and, and were not going to change their lives. They weren't going to be politically active. He, he was, Abby was just another entertainer. And in fact, there was a period there where he actually tried to do nightclub entertaining. He did a few appearances and then he tried to have a radio show, you know. So he, he kind of, like he both went along with the entertainer thing, but I think it also hurt him that, that um, he, he wasn't influencing people to, like an organizer, to get them active. And I, so that was discouraging to him. And he start, probably started getting cynical about, about young people. In what way, what kind of response did you have to his suicide? I, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I think it was Paul Krasner who called me up and told me about it. And I was living in, I moved back to Berkeley. My, Judy and I had moved back to Berkeley. And uh, I was absolutely shocked. Um, uh, and I, I figured out afterwards uh, why. After a little, you know, the, the real shocking thing was for me, Abby had always been this symbol of life force. And whatever I would think about any particular thing he might do, or whatever disagreements I might have from him, there was always this exuding, powerful life force. And the idea that the life, that life force no longer existed was very unsettling to me. I was, boy, I was really shocked. I was stunned. And I remember right after I, I hung up, talking to Paul, I told Judy, and we just walked out, just took a walk on the street. And it was awful. It was just an awful thing. You lose a friend like that. I had already lost Phil Oaks. And, uh, but Phil had had a long period of alcoholic degeneration. And, um, and even then it was shocking. But uh, for Abby to take his life, that was that was just, that, it was like life killing itself it was for me, I guess. It was awful. Um, uh, we've been talking about him all this time. Uh, I want to wrap it up here. Okay, okay. Um, if, if you could just try to put him into some kind of perspective, the, you know, the, the young guy out there organizing the Yippie demonstrations and the Wall Street thing, and the, what, what's, what do you think his impact is? How should he be remembered? Well, um, I know that today, Abby's books still sell on eBay. And some of them have been republished. And I know I keep getting email from young people who want to ask me questions about Abby. Um, that it's an on, that his is an ongoing impact. Um, and that his fears 
that he was just being reduced to being an entertainer did not pan out. That a generation came along that many, at least some of its members, interested in what he really stood for, reading his books, looking up his friends on, on, the, on the internet, asking them questions, driving them nuts. Um, uh, so I would say Abby has had an enduring influence in, in America in terms of being a symbol of rebellion, a, a symbol of critical thought, and an incredible symbol of creativity. And the idea that, you, that protest isn't a hand-me-down thing, that you have these rituals and you continuously act them out, reenact them, repeat them, but that you can actually invent uh, forms of protest that, that are as creative as your goals. You want to make really, have creative goals really change the world? will change the forms of protest and really get the energy out there, get, get people to think differently and act differently. And Abby was such a figure, an uh, important figure in recognizing the need to develop new forms of protest and then actually doing it. And I think that's why ultimately his reputation endures. And that's why he survived the coke bust and still wasn't destroyed by it politically. Because what he did was so important in terms of um, this notion of new tactics and, and entertaining tactics and tactics that are in innovative and, um, and fun, actually. You know, not just reading a lot of boring leaflets or chanting the same slogans but actually enjoy yourself and making people who observe you on the side enjoy themselves as a way of bringing them in. That's what, that was his contribution, and it endures, and I guess it will, it will endure. Um, Tom Hayden always used to say, oh, Abby's a Voltaire. Uh, and um, uh, he endures. He's gone, but here I am talking about him. So he endures. Very good. Um, yeah. I appreciate that. We need two things from you. Just first, we need. I have to. Sure. Okay. Judy, mm, we're sort of done. We're going to do the proverbial walking shot. What's that? Mike? The the room tone for Stu Albert's interior. It'll be thirty seconds. Yeah, just don't look at me.
60s pants. <laughs> <laughs> they build themselves up. But what he, he said, said, he I said wanted to was a serial killer. He said he did it to embarrass law enforcement. He had been brought in oh, on a gun he, possession he, charge. He certainly did that. Oh, he completely embarrassed. Them. And the Texas a nice, nice bunch of guys, yeah. those guys. Yeah. So, um, but it was a fascinating story. Uh, I absolutely love working on it. That was my latest one, and I've done uh, fictions. So the cops weren't talking to each other. Like, you know, he'd kill somebody in one county or one part of LA County and then kill someone in another. So they just didn't know that it was the same guy. But then they did know yeah. for the longest time. They knew that he was connected to this one cop. It's amazing how they put, put these cases together on people. Other ones who are just. Well, they, well, they see, that's another interesting thing. Generally speaking, with a few exceptions, we met the dumb cops. Yeah. The kind of cops who are the, the cream of the detectives <laughs> or anything like that. We, we met guys who had the BP. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and, and so, some of them were crackers. I mean, his, his whole thing is that, well, you know, yeah. the, there's a lot of pressure oh, internally in oh, God. the police well, we've department. Been, we've been together 30 to some odd years. Crack heads. And we've been married since 1960. So, yeah, yeah, you did, yeah. But we've been, yeah, the rookie cops or... Well, there was, there's no challenge to crack in 60 years. Yeah. Yeah. That's the I mean, that's what we've noticed. You know, when past, people do like come and they interview him or other friends of ours, it's like there's always now local crews, local people who actually do the work, which is never used to be that way. It's like flying to people who spend a lot of money now. Yeah, they don't spend money on the No, of course they don't, right? That's a big part of philosophy. But there didn't ever...